The antenna I use here is a G5RV, about 30 meters from end to end, with the top styled like an inverted V. There's about 10 meters of feed line dropping straight down. And in a little box at the base of the mast, I have this ballon. Today, I want to see how I can load it on 160 meters. What you're seeing here is the feeders tied together as I want to load it up as a vertical, shaped like a T. And I've just got two wires along the ground, not very long, each 10 meters. That's the length of my yard. And I've just put it on an antenna analyzer. And due to the light, it's a bit hard to see, but you can see a pronounced drop. That is almost exactly three megahertz. If you look at the numbers there, you could actually use this on a three megahertz transmitter without any problems. What is significant about three megahertz as we saw on the dip? Actually, quite a lot. 300 divided by three megahertz, and this is how you get the wavelength of a radio frequency in meters, is 100 meters. A quarter of that is 25 meters. How do we relate that to the dimensions of the antenna that I did the test on? The feed line is 10 meters, and each half across the top is 15 meters. Add the two together, and you get 25 meters, or one quarter of a wavelength. That's a resonant frequency. It's reassuring the results we got on the analyzer, that is a dip at three megahertz, correlate with what you'd expect from the antenna's dimensions. The next thing I've done is to put a variable capacitor in series with the antenna connection. I've got both sections in parallel, so I'd say the capacitance here would be about 600 to 800 picofarad. I've got it fully meshed, and if you look at the screen, you can see that the frequency has gone up a bit. Now 3.22 megahertz. At half capacitance, it's gone up a bit more to 3.520 megahertz. And it's a fairly sharp curve. So you could put this onto an 80 meter transmitter and you'd be tuned up fine. Now I'll just go higher and higher. At minimum capacitance, there's a very slight trough, but it's hardly significant. That dip is around five megahertz. If you look at the other numbers, it's going to be a highly reactive load, and you'll need to do something else if you're going to use it on this frequency. That compares to 80 meters, where the numbers are pretty good, and you could use it as is, without connecting any extra inductance or other matching network. This test shows there are some frequencies where you can just add an inductor or capacitor and you'd be fine. Whereas other frequencies where the impedances are more complex require a more complex matching network. That could be something like an L match. You could be using inductors and capacitors in series or parallel, depending on the type of reactants you wish to tune out. The aim of all this, since we're using 50 ohm coaxial cable to the transceiver, is a 50 ohm resistive impedance. Next thing is to do a test on 80 meters, with the antenna set up as a vertical T. That should be good for ground wave coverage, though most times not as good as the G5RV, given the limited ground radial system. This is a bucket inductor made for 630 meters. But today I'll see what I can do to get it to operate on 160 meters. There's a variometer, so I can use this for fine inductance adjustments along with taps with alligator clips that I can use for coarser settings. As soon as I connected it, there's a nice dip. Only problem, it's at the wrong frequency, just under 1.2 megahertz. 
I've tapped the coil right down and brought the frequency up. Now it's in the 160 motor band. Pretty much spot on since tonight's net is on 1850 kilohertz. Here's a schematic of the bucket variable coil. There are taps about every 10 turns and I've got the tap in this case on the 10 turns from the bottom. There's a lot more turns than needed for 160 meters because this was built for 630 meters. The connection to the transceiver is here. It so happens that the taps for both the transceiver connection and the connection to the antenna are at the same point. The small coil inside the bucket is on a piece of a wooden doweling. That rotates so that you get a small amount of variation in inductance. So that is good for finer tuning adjustments. Anyway, that just adds with the inductance already in here and goes up to the antenna to provide some inductive loading to electrically lengthen it. As for the wire I'm using, you can probably tell from the colour that it's from an old mains extension cord. Here in Australia we use brown for active and blue for neutral. Just a 10 amp extension cord, that's all. About the cheapest way of getting a large amount of insulated wire that's reasonably thick. If you're running a lot more power then I would use something bigger but for what I'm doing this is fine. And the bucket here would be about 35 centimeters maybe in diameter. It's not perfect but I'll connect the feed line to the transceiver and we'll give this a go tonight. VK3KHZ, 31 kilometers from here, runs both a whisper receiver and a web SDR. It's just before 6 p.m. and he was getting me at minus 10 on whisper. Now we'll try to see if any signal can be received on SSB. In both cases, running five watts. This is a test with VK3KHZ's SDR. A little bit later on, and a little bit more power. This one is at Freeman's Reach in New South Wales. Now, Tasmania. Next we'll try VK2OB. Well, as it happens, you're 10 dB over 9. This is a very strong signal, Peter. 